Felix here and happy Monday to you. It seems somebody's messed with the global time zones, um, messing up not just one appointment of mine, but two, but the second one I realized um, it's probably me. <laughs> so um, that's what's going on in the world. But we've got a ton to go through here because this week is the week of all weeks. This is like the make or break it week for many people, many traders, and I want to walk you through it. I want you to understand what the risks are so you can know what is a good idea, what's a bad idea. Before we do that in the Halloween spirit, happy Halloween, by the way, I've got America's, even the other direction, you see everything is upside down today, America's scariest stocks, 662 stocks that are basically about to run out of cash. Uh, download it, phoenixfriends.org slash 662, and check whether any of yours are on that list. Because if they are, you're probably going to want to do something about that. And it's a thing of beauty, this benchmark. I don't worry, I, I didn't sort of Halloween theme it or anything like that. Uh, but here it is in all its glory. Tons and tons of tons of companies on there, which are basically all pretty much bankrupt. So um, if you have one of those, obviously look into like their funding and who their backers are and everything like that. If there is some, you know, mystery, a cash stash somewhere, but it, they're, they're not looking good. Now, quick look at the futures, moderately bearish this morning. Uh, VIX popping up just a smidgen, the dollar up a little bit, which isn't usually a good sign for the markets. And if we look at the market hasn't opened yet no almost almost there even by my strange time zone so yes we've gone we've gone over to the dark side um we're looking at dark numbers let me know if this is easier for you to see by the way gamestop is up which is never a good sign sorry it just isn't for the market uh, sofi roku and so on are up we've got big earnings as well this week pulsed a little bit up but the rest of the market is not chinese stocks tanking further today and i'll walk you through why that is palantir down a percentage point and then the big boys are down just a touch the tesla's down 0.6 percent we've got amazon down 0.4 percent at 103 nike's at 93 what else have we got here yeah so that's kind of moderately cautious going into the big data of well, the day, big data on, on Tuesday, right? It's a Tuesday, no, Wednesday, the Fed meeting. Somebody saying to them, yeah, okay. All right, let me, I'm reading my own comments here. Okay, let me let me walk you through the key stuff that's actually happening here this week and why, okay, first of all, why is this a risky week? Well, because everything's happening this week. So we've got um, today out the uh, job opening numbers key, key, key bit of data. Why? Because it's forward looking, right? Job openings. If you don't want to hire people because you think the economy is going kaput, then you just cancel your job opens. Nothing you need to do about that. No legal repercussions are very easy to do. Much, much more forward looking than employment numbers. On Wednesday, we're getting the Fed interest rate decision and much, much more important the Fed press conference. We truly, genuinely, deeply care what Jay Powell is going to say. Is he going to change one word? That's what we're going to do. And then on Thursday, we've got some the non-manufacturing data, non-farm payrolls on Friday, and unemployment rate. Again, super, super important. And to top it all off, I thought that's the European data. Okay, we look at the European data in a second. As CTAs, which is essentially, uh, you can sort of think of it as algo trading. They're kind of big funds who trade on technicals and a bit of fundamentals. And if you look at where that's been going here, US equity is in, are, are in orange. You can see it's gone up a little bit, right? So a little amount of money is poured into the market last week. Not a lot. You know, this is where we normally are up here. And at the moment, we're down there. A bit a little bit of peaking up. So it's a little bit what we were talking about last week. Now, why is this such a dangerous market? Well, if you look at put call ratios, and I appreciate not everybody's an options trader, not everybody looks at these things. So let me sort of dumb it down a bit. It's kind of what I always aim to do. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way. It doesn't mean like, you know, economic and financial information is usually packaged in such a way that nobody can comprehend it. Uh, so what happens if you get a put call ratio? So normally a put call ratio on the S&P is maybe 1.3, 1.4, something like that. So right now it's 1.5. Is that scary? Does that mean the market is really bearish? Not really. But if you go out to the 17th, which basically covers this whole week and all the economic data coming out that's important, it's at 10. 
And here, the put call open interest is at nine. And what's that mean? That means people are incredibly bearishly hedged set up. So therefore, if the economic data comes in a little bit better than expected from a stock investor point of view, if the Fed's a little bit softer, if unemployment is a little bit higher, then what happens? All these guys who've bought a gazillion puts have to unwind those trades because they're going to lose a lot of money. So what do they do? How do they unwind them? Well, they become bullish. They have to buy the other side of the trade. They end up buying stocks. So therefore, if this data this week comes in a little bit more bullish, the market is going to go off like a rocket ship. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, but if it does, it might. And that's something to be aware of with your positioning if you are trading or if you're looking at short-term gains to appreciate what's going on here. And most people never really look at this stuff. Now, we're not super oversold anymore. Uh, we have crept back up into the positive levels, uh, which is we were like down here last week. So that means the market is the opportunity for making a ton of money out of this bear market rally, as I would call it, this, this little bit of a squeeze is uh, is not as great as it was last week. Uh, why? Because, I mean, not everybody's turned bullish, but some people have. We are now at a 0 0.1 sentiment uh, of, on this is, this is Goldman Sachs's uh, sentiment indicator. And, you know, before we were at like minus one, right? So we've come up a great, great, great long, long deal. And why is that? Because funds have actually started to buy the market here. And we can see that last four weeks, we've got $29 billion in, in, in equity, uh, leaving fixed income, so leaving uh, bonds. We've had, just on the 26th, $22 billion coming in. So there is money that's starting to pour in, and that's obviously positive, and that's what's helped to shape this mini rally that we saw last week in the face of adversity. And, and we're making some money out of that. We did make money out of that last week, which is why we're up, or one of the reasons we're up 103%. Uh, consistency is what we aim for, 11% up on October so far. And now, am I going to trade this week? Uh, yes, but after the Fed speaks, I'm not going to do anything. I might uh, take some risks off the table. It's always a good move to de-risk before big, unexpected, big, unpredictable events. And the Fed is fairly unpredictable. Now, if you're holding Chinese stocks, you're wondering, uh, is the end near or is it, you know, is it time to, to jump off something? So, well, part of the problem is that the renminbi is down something like 13% since March. And this continues yet again today. The NASDAQ is at, have I got a chart on that? Yeah, we do. The NASDAQ is at 2,005 levels. 2,005 levels. Oh my God, that's like, what, 17 years of nothing? Uh, well, if you held continuously and never sold a thing, yeah. So that's pretty bad, right? Why is that? Well, lockdowns again, there is more COVID, you know. People tend to catch these things during seasonal flu time. And, and that's basically what's going on here. So not a good moment because if you think about the renminbi or the, the CNY or whatever you call it, yuan, it's all the same thing, by the way. And renminbi tends to be more like what people say in, 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 in a speak. Um, um, and yuan is, is, is more of a, a written a word on, on the Chinese currency. But that's beside the point. Uh, what happens when you report earnings in US dollars? So they report in US dollars, but they receive CNY, right? And therefore, the CNY is now worth minus 13%. So earnings go down 13% in US dollar real terms. And that's a problem. And that's like the exaggerated version of what we're seeing with Apple and Microsoft and Netflix earnings. But who's this also bad for? Who's this very, very bad for? Well, companies with very large China exposure, Tesla, for example, right? Anybody who receives like 10, 20, 30% of their revenue from China is receiving a heck of a lot less money unless they keep hiking their prices, which Tesla isn't. So that's definitely something to bear in mind with, you know, earnings seasons going forward. Now, the 10-year, okay, the, the stock market, the S&P, is basically inversely correlated to the U.S. 10-year yield. Why is that? The U.S. 10-year yield is essentially the interest that the U.S. government will pay you, a little bit simplified, uh, 
for buying their debt, right? So if they pay you more for their debt, then it means your risk-free return goes up because we assume the US government is going to continue paying their interest bills. So therefore, stocks become a little bit less attractive because if I can get 4% with zero risk, why do I want to go and buy a stock that maybe gets me 8 or 10 or 12% with potentially a lot of risk, right? So it makes it less appealing. So usually, if you invert the 10-year, which is what we, is, is done here in this chart, then the 10-year is the, pur the purpley line, then normally the S&P and the 10-year move pretty much in line. So they're very, very closely inversely correlated. Now, occasionally, you get a schism. You get a gap in the S&P in the 10-year, and that's precisely what we've got right now, a massive move up of the S&P while the 10-year is, is, is essentially going up still. So that's unusual and not really sustainable. The last time we had that, when was it? Whenever that was here. Uh, I can't figure out the time scale is on this. Um, but what happened? The S&P tanked. So this is a bit of a warning sign, I think, for anybody who is bullish for a more long-term duration, which I am not. Glenn says, on the flip side, won't producer costs go down 13% for companies manufacturing in China? Yes. So exporting from China is a lot more... Ex uh, a lot better. It's good for inflation fighting as well. China is doing its bit uh, by in, in two folds. One is that the fact that the economy is growing more slowly means it's a lot less demand for commodities. So they're reducing global commodity and oil, you know, oil price inflation and everything else that we're buying, rare earths and so on. And also the cost of exports, that anything that's made in China, which is pretty much everything, is, is, is also coming down. So yeah, there is a, I, I, I like your uh, silver lining to that story there. Now, big earnings this week is what's the other part of like what makes this into a fairly scary week, actually. I mean, very risky week, very, very high risk week. So we've got some big boys reporting today, not so much. Well, Striker is a fairly big one. And we've got tomorrow, Uber, we've got Pfizer, we've got British Petroleum, we've got Toyota, we've got Airbnb, we've got AMD reporting tomorrow. And then on Wednesday, which also happens to be the Fed Day, CVS, Estee Lauder, GSK, market just opened, a Roku, um, Etsy, Robinhood, less important, but still an indicator, Albemarle, and then really gets big again and juicy on Thursday, PayPal, Coin, Starbucks, and then on Friday, Nothing I particularly care about on Friday, but there's still some big names in there, DraftKings and, and, and so on, especially for the retail space. Uh, so I am going to start trading again, basically there <laughs> in that direction, uh, because this is where the Fed starts talking. And I do not care to be in the, in the, in the kind of... Uh, hurricane that the Fed could potentially unleash in, in one direction or another. So I'm basically going to, going to sit all of this out, completely skip it, not care one little bit. So if I also reporting tomorrow and then uh, move on with the rest of the week and, and look for some nice opportunities there. And of course, I'll share them with you and everybody who is in the uh, coaching community, which is, I see a lot of you guys on here already, which I appreciate. Uh, SoFi is on Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, so Okay, I was I was talking about market moving earnings. So far, is too small to be a market moving earnings event. I, unfortunately, at this point, you know, um, something like a like an like an Etsy or a, or an Uber or an AMD uh, or, or a PayPal, for that matter, is going to move the market much more. Whereas a SoFi is 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 interesting for me personally, and I think interesting for many of you. But it's not going to in itself move the market. It's just too small. So earnings. Are they bad? Are they good? Earnings have actually come in a little bit disappointing, but not hugely disappointing. But next earnings, the forward guidance for the next quarter is what's truly bad, <laughs> right? So the, the median earnings revision for 2009 to 2019, uh, when we're sort of trending down, is the gray line, and this is now. So coming down, yep. Definitely. So next quarter, not so shiny. And we are getting more misses. So we are, the red line here are the misses. So the misses are going up. 
And that's generally speaking, not a great indicator, right? We had that 2011-12, sort of we had started, started seeing that there. And at the same time, the beats are coming down. So not, well, just an indication of where we are in terms of the, 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 the cyclicality, I'd say. So what does that mean for us? Well, there's two, two things that are happening here. The pain trade is everybody who set up bearish, which is the majority of the market, hence the huge put volumes who would benefit from the market coming down, right? That's the pain trade. So when and if the market gets some positive signals this week because the Fed says something but not truly horrific or say PayPal comes with better numbers and that kind of thing, then the pain trade is a real thing and we get a rally, right? So that's the that's the that's what I've been talking to you guys about the last week or so. So this would imply a short-term rally, quite possibly followed by another, another gap down. Now, what would real pain look like? Well, real pain would be the Fed deciding it wants tighter financial conditions. So at the moment, US financial conditions have improved somewhat. It's the white line here. And the Fed isn't really going to like that. So if they are going to want to tank this down some more and hit us with not just 75 basis points on Wednesday, but the same again on Friday, then I think certainly in, in mid-December, when that becomes a reality, or unless they basically tell us about it now, it, it would be real pain in a sense, because all those guys who are short suddenly making a lot of money and everyone else jumps on the trade and anybody who was in, in calls is, is losing money and then the whole money, you know, they have to cover it, they have to short, so the market goes down significantly more. Either way, you're going to get a lot of volatility. A lot of volatility. That's kind of the risk here. And again, you can make money out of that. We talked about that on um, Saturday on the coaching call, how to set up trades that basically make money just on, on, on volatility. And, and, and Elliot and some of my coaches have been talking about that too. Now, European numbers for our, our Euro files. Well, GDP number came in worse than expected. So this is bad. The growth rate quarter on quarter is worse than expected. Inflation is a whopping 10.7% for October. Year on year and month on month, it went up to 1.5%. So these are all pretty horrific numbers. And if you think it's just the Russians' fault, no, it's not. Core inflation is also at 5%. It's got, went up even beyond consensus estimates. So this is just terrible set of data, basically, for Europe. Um, let me just see if you guys are asking anything here. Feel free to ask any more questions. Just put them in the chat again. I'll, I will run through the questions here in a second. If you haven't already considered talking to us about how you can learn how to trade, how to make an extra income stream, become a better investor, think about it a little harder. It's now the end of October. Are you in a financially better place than you were in January? Are you on the trajectory you actually want to be on? on? Are you quitting the job that you loathe and all that sort of thing? And I don't mean that in a menacing way. It's just like we all start the year off with like these big plans. And unfortunately, most people don't really jump on board um, and, and really get them there. And that's part of what we do with coaching. So we, we aim to hold you accountable. So go to phoenixfrance.org slash coaching, book a call with us. What do you need to do for it? You need to have a five, six, seven, eight, or nine figure portfolio to be a part of that community of just ambitious people who want to learn. You don't need to have any options knowledge. We'll, we'll teach you that. Don't worry about that. It's just uh, the motivation that you need in, in, in a certain portfolio size, five, six, seven, eight, nine figures. If you're not quite there yet with that portfolio size, you know what? Brilliant. You're starting out, most exciting place to be. What do you do about that? Well, go and join the master options program at felixfriends.org slash options. Write down that coupon code there, freedom, because I haven't taken it off yet. It's meant to expire now uh, at the end of the month, which I think is today, right? Um, Halloween. <laughs> and um, you get to learn not just my strategy, my trading protocol, but you also see me trade live every week. And, and so therefore you get that insight. You also get uh, daily chat support from our amazing team. So, are you DCAing any stocks or waiting for Fed meetings? Um, Matt, I'm always DCAing into stocks week after week after week after week. Nothing is ever going to stop me, pretty much. And um, I aim to make money out of my more market insight with, with trading rather than with stock buying because it's just such a long term project that I just, you know, we take the profits, we reinvest them. Very, very simple. 
Let me see if I missed any questions here. There's a lot of chat, which I truly appreciate. So if you, if you asked a question and I, I uh, forgot it, I missed it, please put it in the, in, the, in the chat again. It's free. You don't need to be a member or anything. Just need to hit the subscribe button. That's all YouTube asks of you. Okay, you guys talking about buying the big tech stocks. Who's buying the big tech stocks? Anyone? Um, put it in the chat if you're buying the big tech stocks and, 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 and write maybe why. Um, you're talking about the metaverse. Yeah, it's an interesting space. I, I still think there is a space for it. So the question is, who is going to own that that rate, that space? Will it be one of the gaming companies? Will Microsoft do it? Will Apple do it? Will Meta do it? You know, just because you call yourself Meta doesn't mean you own the metaverse, right? So we'll do a quick recap in a second as well as with the, all the big stuff that's happening here. Um, Justice Baker is buying Meta, I think. I get the feeling. Of course, always bear in mind, none of the above or below is financial advice. You know that by now. What does it, will it take for the dollar to come down, interest rates to go down, or the rest of the world's interest rates to go up and there to be less fear and panic? Uh, the less fear we have, the less we flee into the dollar. And if Europe outdoes the US on interest rate hikes, well, they're going to get a massive recession, but that, that would do, do, the, do the trick. Let me see if there are any other questions. Okay, ask away, guys. That's why we do these things live. Uh, so let me do a quick recap for anyone who's just jumped in here. Here we go. So enormous macro week this week, and hence also being a very, very risky week. We get job openings today at uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time, that is, at 4 p.m. is Paris time. And then we get tomorrow the Fed interest rate decision, more importantly, the Fed press conference. On Thursday, we get non-manufacturing data. On Friday, we get non-farm rolls, non-farm payroll and unemployment data, and then the following week, inflation data. So it's a it's a whopper of a, of, of a macro kind of marathon coming up. And that's also one reason why the market is incredibly volatile and going to be incredibly volatile these next couple of days. So set up smartly. You can make a lot of money from that because you can trade the volatility, but not set up smartly. It's going to slap you around uh, fairly hard. Uh, Ian, when will the rate curve uninvert? Well, it has uninverted, Ian, but it's still going nuts. Let me show it to you. Uh, what, what, what is it called? VIX. Here we go. So it looks nice and healthy, right? Looks like in the right direction, but it isn't really because actually, let me take a screenshot. Can I take a screenshot? Maybe. There we go. Okay. What What's kind of hidden in that data? And that's always what you have to bear in mind when you use a tool. Like very few tools are perfect. Um, only the Pope's tools are perfect. And that's now, oh, is it, so that's, that's November. It actually looks like this. And why is that? Because that's the nine day. And this is now. So there is this massive spike in there still, which is not really what you, what you, what you want to have, right? So... I suspect there might be some, there might, will probably be another one of these in December when the Fed speaks again. There'll probably be another one of these. So there is still a bit of market madness <laughs> left for us to enjoy. It hasn't gone quite away yet. Um, CTAs, which are basically a big funds that trade on technicals and basically buy when the market goes up and sell when the market comes down. I know it's a rocket science of a strategy, isn't it? They use technical analysis. It's come up a bit. So we've got some CTA money coming in, which is partially what fueled the, the rally last week, which is what we were talking about. And when you've got put call ratios that are massively, massively above what you would expect them to be, and at the same time, you get some pretty decent volume here with you know really big, juicy volume, 100,000, look at that. And that's at two. Normally, put call ratios... 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3, something like that at two or even at 10, like this one here, or, you know, it's insane. And what does that mean? It means everyone's covering their backside because they're long stocks and they are 
buying protection. They're buying enormous amounts of protection because they're worried about all this data coming in. And therefore, if the data comes in a little bit better, what happens is that they have to close these positions to their, their protection because now they're losing their money. So they not just sell the puts, but they're in the process end up buying shares for the market makers to be to be neutral. So what does that mean? Well, this has a potential to cause an enormous short-term spike, an enormous short-term rally. So let's skip past that one. Uh, the sentiment has turned a little bit more positive. Uh, we're now at 0 0.1 on Goldman Sachs's sentiment indicator. And what does that mean? It means this positioning for this particular trade was better last week, quite frankly. Like you would have made more money setting it up last week than if you set it up right now. Just because everybody's watched our videos and copied it. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, also, don't do that. Seriously, if you want to, if you, if you think there is some inside here, then make sure you use a paper trading account to, to, to mess around with it. You don't ever want to be following somebody where you don't really understand what's going on and just hoping on a whim that he might be right that day. I mean, everything that I do comes from Winston, my golden retriever. Where is he? He's out and about somewhere. So we are, however, seeing funds that are buying about $29 billion the last four weeks. So we're still seeing that inflow again, which is nice. And that's also what's supporting us here. And that's also part of the reason, understanding really what the market does. It has been has been helpful. But you, in all honesty, you don't need to understand what the market does in that much depth. You really just need to like have a strategy that works, have a, a trading protocol that actually works pretty much no matter what the market does. And especially when we have high IV, like we have right now, that really works. And, you know, we've made very nice money here. We've made we're up 103% on the year. And you are very welcome to give us a call to find more about how and if we can help you to get to your financial targets. And why do I say if in that case? Because it's not for everybody. And, and we will tell you very honestly whether or not it is for you. But it, provided you are motivated, provided you have a goal and you want to get somewhere different to where you are right now, Give us a ring at FelixFrenz.org slash coaching and we'll have a chat with you. And now running through the, the rest of this here, Chinese currency, RMB is down 13% since Feb, keeps falling. And all of this COVID lockdowns again and you know, renewed outbreaks and all that kind of stuff, obviously, is going to continue to put pressure on the currency. So what does it do? Well, as Glenn said, it makes Chinese exports cheaper. It makes it cheaper for, say, Tesla to manufacture cars in China and then re-export them to Europe, which, yeah, is what they do. But on the flip side, the Teslas that Tesla sells in China, I'm not picking on Tesla here, just an example. Well, that income comes in in renminbi, and then they have to convert that into the US dollar. And when they do that, they're getting 13% less than they thought they would. So earnings kind of disappoint. So that's, that's part of the problem for stocks that have big China exposure here. And this is the Chinese stock market. And Anyone holding any Chinese ADRs will have experienced this. It seems to know only one direction. It goes down and down and down and down. So we are down, uh, yeah, absolutely horrific amount. 70 something percent since, well, beginning of time, 2005 or so. And what does that mean? Well, we're back at like 2005 levels. That here is 2005. It's pretty much all the valuation. So the Hang Seng just hit a 2005 record low today. The 10-year is uh, showing us be cautious because the gap between the 10-year and the SPX is massive. That typically results in the SPX um, taking a bow. But let's have a look at the live market here. Let's see what's actually going on. So what's up today? GameStop, Upstart, Ride, Robinhood. Does it feel like 2001 or something? What happened here? So a lot of the riskiest stuff is up. Mullen is down, though. Chinese stocks are down. AMD is down pre-earnings. Google down to 94.80. Ouch. Uh, PayPal down to 84 Intel's down 1%. Tesla is down almost 1% to 226. Microsoft is at trading at 234. So a lot of the big boys are down here, less than a percentage point, but still Uber down 0.7% again pre-earnings. So the market is kind of like cautious, uh, partially because the market realizes that when we have a rally, just because the Fed meets, the Fed's kind of like, we don't like that. Let's see if we can do something about that. Now, 
Earnings coming up this week. Some big boys, AMD, Uber, you know, Etsy, PayPal, Coin on Thursday. It's another big earnings week, Estee Lauder and so on. So watch out for this. Uh, it's going to be really, really a very, very volatile week. But the key thing, more, much more important than earnings, is what the Fed says on Wednesday. And of course, I'll cover that for you. Uh, earnings, looking forward, the expectations we have for the next quarter, not this quarter, but the next quarter, markets are forward looking, are not good. So this blue line here is what where we are right now. So that line, I'm just going to make it a little bit more colorful, is earnings expectations right now. Historically, we have the gray line here. So you can see we're falling below the averages here. So earnings next quarter expectations revisions are, are definitely coming down. The misses are piling up. And um, you see that the red lines here are misses. So each quarter we're having have more earnings misses than in the last one. And at the same time, the beats in blue are also coming down. So that's not a particularly bullish signal. So say if you looked like 2010 or something like that, you, you were seeing that uh, exactly that kind of kind of setup. So that's what I was just talking about. Financial conditions have loosened somewhat and the fed wants them to keep tightening and and here in the last week or so we you know we are we are looking a little bit better here on that the white line is u.s financial conditions so they don't want that so that's one of the reasons they might come out a little bit more 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 harsh on us this week uh, europe has a completely different set of problems to to the u.s i'd say inflation is over 10 percent core inflation is up uh, the economy is is very very much heading for a recession but european earnings are amazing so it's quite interesting how the, there's an enormous disconnect. Well, I thought it was interesting. How there's an enormous disconnect. Winston thought it was rather interesting. He fell asleep when I told him. Between the real economy and earnings of, of European companies. So the stock market and the real world, not that closely correlated in the short time. Now, let me see what the questions are here, guys. I need your options. From what I understand from what you said, you want to trade options after high volatility events, says Cherry Tiger. Okay, so normally... Normally, I would trade earnings. So what I would normally do is I would look at where our earnings, I probably wouldn't trade Uber, but say I'd look at, you know, say AMD and say, okay, what does AMD normally do before, uh, after earnings? And it goes up or down 5%. Let's just say as an example, say we look at the last 10 quarters and it always moves somewhere between one and 5%. So we set up a trade where we would then make money as long as AMD moves up and down 8% or 10%. So we are a bit more safe and we collect a very nice premium on that. And we don't actually make money out of the stock price moving. We make money out of volatility coming down. And that's what a lot of people don't really understand. It's not about stock price movements. Options are not some sort of annex to stocks. Options are a completely different asset class that work in a very, very different way. So if you're trading options, really learn that, understand that. You have to understand what's, what's driving it. It's what we would normally do. Why am I not doing it at the moment? Well, because stocks report earnings and then they fall 20% and that's just balmy and I don't want to be part of something that's completely unpredictable. I like predictable. I like boring. I like reliable for my, my returns. And at the moment, I don't do that. So what can we do? Well, you can wait for the AMD earnings to be out in the evenings, study them, read them, see what the market reaction is. And then you set up a trade an hour or so into the Wednesday market based on that information. And you can make very nice money on that too. We did that last week. We did that like three times on, on, on Thursday. Let me see if I missed any questions here. Neil's bought some Google, good balance sheet, true. Alec thinks that Meta will go to zero. Fairly unlikely. Have you seen how much money they make? Is AMD an example of a company that's dependent on China, Eric? I honestly am not the greatest expert on uh, chip stocks, which is why I generally don't trade them because I don't really understand them. Uh, if I'm going to trade something, yeah, I mean, you, I'm sure they have significant manufacturing and supply chain from, from there, but also tech, sorry, chips rather, semiconductor chips, at the moment are quite political because everyone's getting subsidies right, left and center. So you have to understand that space a little bit. Do you invest in ETFs? 
I don't personally, but I do think they're brilliant. And, and, and I might actually. So I'm at the moment, I put quite a lot of funds into a fund. And at some point, from a risk management point of view, I might just put money into an ETF that's fairly similar, just in case there is ever anything funny going on at the fund, right? Does the Twitter delisting me 44 billion will be available for investors to reinvest? Yes, they have. Well, I don't know if it's 44 billion, but they have to buy the float. They certainly they have to buy the publicly held shares back, or whatever, whatever that number is. Any thoughts about Airbnb? Yeah, I still don't get it. I'm a, I, I use it as a customer. I think it's brilliant. I think hotels uh, make no sense. Even the most luxurious 2,000 square foot suite uh, typically has a fridge and a cooker the size of a, you know, a third of a desk. So I think a lot of people who travel a lot prefer to be in apartments because it's it's like a home, right? You've got everything. You can make your own food. You can you can order in, and you can you can just pop down to the shop and pick up something. And, and most hotels frown upon that. So. I think from that point of view, brilliant. But I still struggle a little bit with the moat. And I know some people think there is a strong moat. I, I just don't know what it is, to be honest with you. Thoughts on Petrobras? Nelly, honestly, none. I, I, again, I don't really cover oil particularly closely. Uh, I might do the occasional XOM trade. Or, but I, I don't own any. Why? Very cyclical. Very cyclical. And I, I, I just think life's too short to own cyclic, cyclical stuff. So if you look at Petrobras, it'll very much, very likely move in line with, with oil prices, right? I suspect. If we overlay WTI on this, same percentage scale. Okay, something happened there but generally speaking it it should move roughly roughly in line with 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 oil prices so obviously they did something right in the summer i don't know what it is but yeah i don't really buy these just because they tend to move up and down too much for me you're shorting soxx okay i would just always recommend hedging the position make sure you're not completely exposed to it because stuff can especially in this market where everybody is set up short. All we need is one bit of positive data and the market like totally explo explodes up and then you're short and then you're caught with your trousers down. So don't, don't be that guy basically. And at the moment, you know, we bounced off that 3949 level here, which I put in before we hit that. If you can watch back my videos the last couple of days, or roughly that anyway what was the high 3905 so that's kind of where a lot of options are set up we break through that you know we are very very bullish uh, but at the same time we break through 3700 you know we also go off in the other direction so just a lot of volatility coming up here moat on that yeah I, okay for example like i went, went to venice and, and and last time i went i uh booked it through a local agency and they have cheaper fees than if you book it through Airbnb. And this time I was in a rush, I booked it through Airbnb and I paid a little bit more. So probably if I go back, when I go back, I'll probably book it again through the agency because I know it's the same people. It's the same company. You can just Google the property you'll find and list it on booking.com on the private websites of some agency. And, and you basically decide how much you pay for, for, for fees, right? So the I think that's a little bit the challenge with their, their pricing model is that their fees are fairly significant and people are cost sensitive, right? When, when they, when they book, book stuff, like it's like, if you can get the same hotel room for less, you do, right? That's why websites like booking.com exist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Reacting uh, Nelly, thank you for to Brazil's elections. Yeah, I, I read, I read that was a pretty tight call yesterday. I, I haven't seen the, the outcome yet. Alula uh, one. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Thoughts on Uber and Airbnb ahead of their earnings? Yeah, I think I, I essentially have the same challenge with both. Well, I'm not quite the same with both, but Uber for me, the challenge is what's the tech advantage? So the, the mode is just like network effect. They've got everybody and their dog signed up and, and therefore it's very easy to use. 
but companies like Tesla, autonomous driving and so on, Google's autonomous driving, everybody's got autonomous driving are potentially massive, massive disruptors to that business model. Because say there was a self-driving Tesla fleet here, would I download the app to use it? Sure, why wouldn't I? Right. So is Uber going to be like the app of apps or like what, what's, the, what's the thing there? Because at the moment, yeah, with all the drivers and so on, that's a pain in the neck to organize. That's a pretty significant moat. But when that goes away, what's the moat then? Are you going to cover SoFi earnings? Uh, I, I, I hope so, Oleg. Yeah, let me look at what time that is tomorrow and I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys know. Why are energy commodities not falling despite recession risks? Well, there is significant demand for oil and the oil manufacturers are a cartel. So they just cut output, right? That's the way it works. They, they aim to keep prices at these sort of levels. They, they enjoy these kind of levels. They don't want them to come down. So therefore, you know, here's the WTI. It's come down quite a bit. But they'd like to stay, I guess, in that $90 to $100 range. I think that for them, that's sort of the sweet spot. So they don't really want us to go back down to the city levels where we were before. So I think it's just production control. I think that's what, what quite a lot of this is. Bank of England meeting tomorrow. All I read today was just basically the UK is in a recession. Uh, that seems pretty clear. But you also have a massive inflation problem. And not all of it is, is energy. So I don't really think they have much of a choice but to kind of continue down this weird European path of rising interest rates in, in, in a recession environment. So, yeah, it's kind of an interesting one. I, I think they might slow down on the quantitative tightening because I don't think the bond market supports it, as we've seen. Who's going to win the World Cup? <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I knew. Do you recommend Meta at 96? I don't ever recommend anything, Oleg. I think by now you know that. I, I, I own quite a lot of Meta stock, and I think it's a it's a it's a, a company with good numbers. But you have to come to a conclusion or not whether you want to buy it at these prices. Is there any key element that'll make you enter a trade? Yeah, loads. I mean, to start with volatility, that would be the first thing I'd look at. It's volatility. You want to look at the stock chart. You want to look up maybe at where open interest sits so you can see where institutions are, are, are sitting and premium. Like what's your what's your return going to be on this, right? Uh, so that you can exit early and safely. Probability of the trade, I'd like that to be 85% plus. So there's quite a lot of bits, little bits to it that are not in, immediately apparent when you, when you start. But, you know, you know what I'm going to say, right? You want to know some more about that? <laughs> Give us a ring at felixfrenz.org slash coaching and I'll... We'll tell you all about it. Can a 75 a hike outcome? I, I think that's just baked in. Everybody expects that. Everybody knows it's going to be 75 basis points. The real question is like, what are they going to say afterwards? The press conference is really what's the interesting bit. Uh, REITs, uh, Soviet, incredibly volatile. So uh, we just open anything here. Let me share my screen with you. Here we go. So this is the Dow Jones equity or REIT, whatever, um, any kind of REIT index, uh, and, and then compare that to, say, QQQ. Oh, sorry. REIT. Compare that to QQQ. So it's more volatile than, 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 than tech stocks. And I think that's something to bear in mind. The ups and downs are sharper. It's very, very, very cyclical. So you uh, need to kind of get in at the right moment. So the, the red and the green is, 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 is the REIT because you buy that at the top, you've got some serious pain incoming. And look at 2020, the REIT dropped 42%. And then the QQQ dropped something like 30%, right? Something like that, 29%, 30%. So it, if you want more volatility, if you want more ups and downs, buy REITs. <laughs> Lost can be KK knows. Uh, thanks very much.
US government gridlock, I, I think it's quite a good thing. I think government gridlock, generally speaking, is, is a very good thing. I think the less they do, the better it is for the market. Let's have a look at the live market here. We are seeing some more greens here. Pulse are notably up in the top five, uh, 3% up, right up. PDD and Tal up, slightly bizarre on that one. SoFi rallying before earnings, well, up 2% rallying, might be a little exaggerated here. Uh, Hood and DraftKings also reporting this week, up a little bit. And VIX is up just a touch, 0.1%. Not a great deal. We actually have a trade on, on, on the VIX, which we might close out tomorrow to take profits on. And where is it? Here it is. VIX, it's up 27% at the moment. Let's see, see what's going on there tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, let me see. Um, what was this chart we were on? Here we go. PayPal down 2%. Uh, Google down 2% to 94, ouch. NVIDIA down 2%, Tesla down 1.8%, Microsoft down 1.5%. So it's it's definitely a, uh, we're feeling a little bit frightened uh, morning uh, before the Fed starts speaking on, on Wednesday. Natural gas, uh, Thomas, for me, that's the same thing really as oil, very closely related. So... I'm not really in a position to know whether or not we are at the top of a market. I think oil might have a bit more to go, but if you look at gas futures, uh, anyway, they're, 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 they'll all do. Very, 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 very volatile, right? So there is at the moment a, a glut of gas hanging around European ports. Uh, but it really will depend on how cold the winter is or not. So is that something I can predict? No. Am I a commodity trader who's rigging the market? No. If I were, I'd probably trade it, but I'm not. So I, I just prefer to go for things that to me seem a lot more predictable that I can actually understand. Job reports today are at 10 a.m., I think, Eastern, 4 p.m. European time. Uh, Steve, uh, you're an interactive broker. It's brilliant. We use it a lot. Uh, do you need full options permissions? So the first thing you need actually is no. First, first of all, you just need a paper trading account and uh, interactive brokers has one without any permissions restrictions. That's the first thing you need to learn it. And then, yeah, you will need, need to apply for a margin account, not because we use the margin, but because brokers require you to have a margin account to really trade options. So to be able to trade, make safer trades, you need a margin account. It makes no sense. Brokers don't get options. But essentially, we want to have do trades where your downside is limited, where you're hedged. So you, you know the worst that can happen with this trade is I'll lose $100, right? That's what we want. We don't want you to have unlimited risk. And to be able to place that safety net for yourself, interactive brokers will ask you to open a margin account, which is like... This makes no sense, guys, but that's just the way it is. So uh, what do you need to do to get that? Uh, you need to fill in a couple of questions and you need to tell them that your investment objective is speculation. Uh, that's, I think, usually what they require. But uh, honestly, if you need any help with that, let us know. I've never had anyone ever out of our thousands of students who couldn't get the permission that they needed. IWM. Um, how it well, I think what I was saying is that IWM does not move in line with big tech because it's not big tech, it's 2000 teeny tiny little stocks. So that's why we got a trade on IWM at the moment, which is what is the trade 160 is our break even. So we set that up last week. So obviously, the price points have changed. So yeah, we have. This lower line here is from where we are bullish up. So it can go up anywhere from there or it can go all the way down to 160. So we're trading at 182 at the moment. So it's a pretty significant drop that would be. And it would be also be a drop below the October and June drops. It would be, well, a, a, a new low in the last two years or so. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but that's why I set it up. Obviously, there's still risk in every trade. 
There we go, guys. I appreciate you tuning in. I appreciate all your questions and your desire to like want to become better investors and learn and so on and keep on that journey. That's really what's going to make a difference. No one else is going to do it for you to take you much further, much quicker. We have a 90 day coaching program to get you cracking felixfranzadrock slash coaching. All you need is a five, six, seven, eight or nine figure portfolio, which is what our current students have. Give us a ring at felixfranzadrock slash coaching. I truly appreciate you joining and watching. Thank you very much. And oh yeah, if you're not quite there yet with the five figures and master options program is for you, 100 plus pre-recorded lectures by me. Plus you get to see me trade live every week. You have access to my master options portfolios. You can see the trades I make in that. And yeah, check it out. Felix Rensselaer, Oxford Options. Appreciate you watching. Thanks very much. Have a beautiful day.